Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this experiment. I think we might call it a public lecture. Goodness knows whether it'll catch on, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll know more by the end of the week. My name's Mark Vesey, and it's an honor for me as principal of Green College to welcome you, whether you're here in person now or uh, seeing this remotely, to the latest series of J. V. Klein lectures at UBC. Now, like every act of hospitality around here, this one of ours depends upon the prior and spectacularly abused hospitality of the Musqueam people whose lands we occupy in an area that was named Point Grey after this promontory, part of the traditional ancestral and still unceded territory of the Musqueam, was claimed by the British as a colonial admiralty reserve in the mid-19th century. To quote a jingle by the expatriate British poet W. H. Auden, who's also going to supply part of the title for the lectures you are about to hear, the situation of our time surrounds us like a baffling crime. Now, baffling may be too generous to most of us at this point, at least with reference to the crime scene that is the history and reality of Canada's relationships with its indigenous peoples. But in any case, there is no doubt of our continuing pressing need for wisdom and expertise of all kinds, including the forensic kind, as we grapple in universities and elsewhere with the situation of our time. It was for assurance of help in that respect that a few decades ago, friends and admirers of John Valentine Klein, sometime judge of the BC Supreme Court and chancellor of UBC, created an endowment to support lectures by individuals with outstanding qualifications in one or more of the fields of government, business, law, and the arts. In other news of these lectures, since Green College began hosting them in 2018, I can report that a book based on Robert Gibbs's lectures on the future of university study is in production with UBC Press, that the typescript of Scott McIntyre's memoir history of Canadian publishing in the late 20th and early 21st century is in the hands of one of the country's top literary agents, and that our Klein lecturer for 2020-21, Michelle Good, author of the prize-winning novel Five Little Indians, and convener for us of a series of lectures on colonial fingerprints and indigenous resurgence in the 21st century, will be spending some time in residence at Green College later this month. And so now to the business of the day, and indeed even more auspiciously, of the first three days of this new academic year. This is the moment at which I was to have turned things over uh, to the 15th president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia, Professor Santa Ono. But what do you know? On this day of all days, this year of all years, he's been called away for a meeting with the provincial government. Uh, he sends uh, his apologies. He is looking forward uh, to meeting and greeting our guest on other occasions this week. So uh, that on behalf uh, of Santa Ono, who was fully expecting to be here until about two hours ago, uh, when something came up. I'd like very warmly to thank the Dean of Law Pro Tem, Janine Benedet, and her colleagues here at the Allard School of Law for partnering with us in these lectures and for providing this magnificent venue. And it's a pleasure for me now to invite Professor Benedet to introduce the Klein Lecturer. Thank you, Janine. Well, thank you so much, Mark, and we're delighted to be able to uh, play host in our beautiful forum in the Allard Hall building to this year's Klein Lecture. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce our Klein Lecturer for this year, uh, Stephen Toop. And I can tell you that having served now for a little over a year in the role of Dean Pro Tem at the law school, I've done quite a lot of introductions of august personages, mostly on uh, Zoom, and of course, they tell you to look at the biography and just hit the highlights. But I actually feel that with Professor Toop, Vice Chancellor Toop, uh, that we could be here for a very long time, even if I uh, committed myself just to that. 
But I will tell you what you probably already know, that we are delighted to be welcoming um, Stephen back to the University of British Columbia. Uh, he has been, of course, at many um, uh, educational institutions in his career. He studied history and literature at Harvard University. He earned degrees in common law and civil law at McGill University. He clerked for the Chief Justice of Canada, the Right Honourable Brian Dixon, and he's also an alumni of Trinity College, Cambridge, where he completed his PhD. Um, he then went on to, uh, to be a law professor and to serve as Dean of Law at McGill University as president of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, um, and most significantly, perhaps for our purposes, president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia from 2006 to 2014. He then went on to be the director of the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs, and then most recently in 2017 became the 346th vice chancellor of the University of Cambridge. And so it is perhaps worth pointing out while there have been 346 vice chancellors at Cambridge, we of course have only had uh, 15 presidents at UBC. So um, um, uh, both, both impressive accomplishments nonetheless. Um, and of course, many of us will know uh, Stephen Toop's uh, scholarship. His academic interests are broad and cover fields such as international law, human rights, uh, international legal theory, and international development. And indeed, over the years, he has held a number of significant roles, consulting roles, um, roles chairing working groups on important pressing issues of our time in international law, uh, human rights and legal theory. And so we're very excited to have him here as this year's Klein lecturer to speak to us uh, on the rule of law um, and to help us map out new directions on this very important topic in such difficult times. So I'll turn it over now to our Klein lecturer, Stephen Toop. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Pro Tem Benedek, and thank you very much, uh, principal, uh, distinguished colleagues and friends. It really is a delight for me to be back at the University of British Columbia, and I'm so grateful to Green College uh, for allowing me to reconnect uh, with the college after many years' absence. The college is, of course, a jewel, architecturally and intellectually, and I'm honored to deliver this year's John V. Klein lectures. Or should I say last year's lectures? Well, such are the vagaries of COVID. This year or last year, it is wonderful to be with you all now. That said, I think we live in an ugly time. Many people all around the world feel uneasy, lost, and anxious. A pandemic? Hard to understand new technologies and globalization have contributed, but the distemper of our times has complex causes. One of the contributors to our great unease is a widely perceived deficit of political legitimacy. That's, I think, made it easier for populist nationalists and other authoritarians to undermine established and emerging democracies alike. Among the ways to address that anxiety is to restore belief in our collective ability to build healthier societies. We need to do two things. One is to recognize and draw upon our shared history of making progress, flawed though the contemporary reality may be and always will be. The other way to recover a sense of purpose and hope is to embrace an action-oriented, pragmatist ethos. In so doing, we recognize the constant refining of the understanding of reality through rational and rigorous debate and debate and discourse that is empathetic and inclusive. That ethos is particularly important as we seek to restore belief in the rule of law. My premise in these lectures is that the rule of law is one of the great achievements of the modern world. 
The famous Marxist historian E.P. Thompson made that claim as well. Yet, it's under deep threat today. As we struggle to manage, even to climb out of our era's anxiety and fear, we need to reconstruct a rule of law for today, using our inherited intellectual resources. It's to this effort to recalibrate and revitalize the rule of law that these lectures are dedicated. The rule of law may seem an abstract concept, today even irrelevant. Loss of faith in the rule of law is not just a consequence of the broader anxiety and confusion around us, it contributes in particular ways to a sense that the world is crumbling, that reason and communal values are lost, and that simple answers and autocratic leaders are the only way to rescue meaning and a sense of equality in our lives. In 1947, W.H. Auden published The Age of Anxiety and won the Pulitzer Prize. This long-form poem is a collection of portraits and monologues of three men and a woman sitting in a New York bar during the Second World War. They're all searching for meaning and identity in a world shifting beyond recognition. Here's a brief meditation from the sole woman, Rosetta, on the world she sees coming. Odorless ages, an ordered world of planned pleasures and passport control, century go sedatives, soft drinks, and managed money, a moral planet tamed by terror. Our sense that we live in a moment of dislocation when the future, perhaps for the first time since the 1950s, looks less rosy than the past, connects us to the fear still present at the end of World War II. We've entered a new age of anxiety. We don't experience the same sources or manifestations of anxiety exactly, but they build from Rosetta's. In this first lecture of three, I want to describe our current anxieties in some detail. I don't pretend that everyone across the globe feels the challenges of our era in exactly the same way. Of course, our experiences are deeply affected by where we find ourselves situated, by our economic and social positions, our age, our location and cultural heritage, our race, sex, and gender identity, and much, much more. However, my own experience, joined up with reading across many fields, leads me to suggest that there are three dominating and interacting social forces that are building upon and reinforcing a pervasive sense of anxiety in our national and global societies, affecting many people all around the world. They are populist nationalism, fear of the global, both in terms of scale and complexity, and practices associated with so-called disruptive technologies. <laughs> well, one might say, so far, so obvious. But I want to go much further in the second and third lectures to draw upon our intellectual and social resources to address these forces and to trace a possible path out of our particular age of anxiety not through the recovery of simple truths, but by using those resources to help us to better understand and work with complexity. To begin then, ours is a world in which there is a constant and deeply damaging confusion of two important concepts, risk and uncertainty. Given the contemporary influence of quantitative economics as a discipline, much social and political analysis is dominated by the calibration of risk. I use the term calibration purposely. Risk is a concept amenable to quantification. One could call risk the known unknowns, 
By that I mean the possibilities that might or might not come into being and where it is at least theoretically possible to calculate the likelihoods of various outcomes. In its most sophisticated version, these known unknowns are calibrated through the construction of probability distributions using large numbers of trials. The assumption behind this kind of analysis is that experts well-versed in numeric skills will ultimately be able to shape most decisions of public policy through cost-benefit analysis. But I want to argue that our world is actually far more difficult to understand than risk assessment might suggest. What about the unknown unknowns? I must pause to say that I'm aware that these phrases, unfortunately, were used by none other than Donald Rumsfeld in a widely mocked speech from 2002 but they actually relate to a profound set of issues in the history of science. The very idea of an hypothesis, what it is that you're seeking to test experimentally, assumes frames of understanding that allow us to assess a limited range of potential outcomes. But what happens when the result is unexpected, outside our paradigm of what is even possible? How can you calculate real uncertainty? Well, you can't. And importantly, you will never be able to do so. Our complex world is not amenable to parsing through pure calculation. We require judgment involving elements like trust and insight. Historically, that is exactly what professions like law have offered to society. And of course, on a daily basis, people just go on with their lives by making assumptions about future states in the world. The point is that we can't rely purely on understanding the numbers to help us navigate our age of anxiety. We've seen that throughout the COVID crisis. The numbers, of course, are relevant and they should inform judgment and action, but they do not directly dictate the parameters of what we should do, individually or societally. That requires recourse to insights from sociology, psychology, history, politics, law, and many other disciplines. Much of the deep anxiety felt in our societies today is rooted in uncertainty that can't be calculated and addressed solely through economic instruments of analysis. Nor can uncertainty be eliminated. Indeed, Hannah Arendt suggested tellingly that uncertainty, quotes, is the decisive character of human affairs, end quotes, because the action set off by humans in society can never be fully contained, nor can the effects be accurately predicted. Action and reaction has no end, as she put it. The unknown unknowns are not limited to pandemics. They include aspects of climate change, sources and effects of educational and income inequality, and various forms of political violence, including terrorism. But I want to focus on the three forces that I identified at the outset because I believe they underlie many others. I think that they play particularly powerful roles in driving our shared anxiety right now in sometimes less than obvious ways. So to repeat, populist nationalism, fear of the global, and technologies with hard to predict disruptive potential. To address these issues requires the exercise of considered human judgment not simply the mathematical calculation of risk. But the new barbarian is no uncouth desert dweller. He does not emerge from fir forests. Factories bred him, corporate companies, college towns mothered his mind, and many journals backed his beliefs. He was born here. 
Auden, the age of anxiety. The violent mob that stormed the U.S. Capitol in January 2021 was indeed bred in factories, many now closed, in corporations and college towns and even in the military. They came mostly from rural areas, towns, and smaller cities across the USA. They're part of a collection of discrete forces often lumped together under the banner populism. The term populist has been invoked constantly and I think indiscriminately over the last, de last decade or so, associated with COVID denial, climate denial, but also with Brexit, the misrule of President Trump, and political actions in regimes across the globe, from the Philippines to Brazil, Poland to India, Hungary to Venezuela. But what do we mean by populism? How is it different from democracy, understood as a form of governance rooted in the popular will? Populism is not a coherent ideology or a political orientation that can be categorized on a continuum from left to right. Latin America is still producing populists of the far left, like Maduro in Venezuela, and of the left, like Obrador in Mexico. But our era is top heavy with right-wing populist leaders. The most extreme are probably Bolsonaro in Brazil, and Duterte in the Philippines. Even major powers are producing populist chief executives, most obviously President Trump, but Prime Minister Modi of India also deploys culturally specific populist tropes to reinforce his power base. What connects them? What forces do they represent? The philosopher Isaiah Berlin viewed populism as, as he put it, an over-rich word, but he still thought it described something useful and suggested that a common core of populist sentiment was a belief in society rather than the state, though as we shall see, the state often becomes the instrument of populist power, a sense that there had been a spiritual fall in the past that clouds the future, an enemy often cast as an elite that threatens social solidarity and around which the people can unite, elements of nostalgia, what Berlin called past directedness, and finally, localism. In a more positive vein, Berlin saw populism as standing for the majority who had been damaged and who seek fraternity, freedom from imposed authority, above all, equality. Importantly for Berlin, the people who respond to populism do not typically seek liberty. Now I find Berlin's thinking helpful here because his description of populism contains elements of empathy. Many contemporary writers adopt a polemical stance that actually reduces analytic clarity. Polemical anti-populist commentators set up a dangerous false choice between status quo politics that's exclusionary and elitist and a populism that's authoritarian and exclusionary in a different sense, being nationalist and xenophobic. If populism is defined without nuance, it risks undermining the very concept of popular will, which has an important, though not exclusive, role to play in our understanding of democracy. The people's will is not necessarily a negative force. Populist sentiment can be driven by entirely accurate perceptions of economic and social inequality, police brutality, policy corruption, or simply a bias to the status quo that favors vested interests. And by realistic claims, that bureaucrats have lost touch with the problems faced by the majority of people. There are forms of populism that make politics far more comprehensible and understandable for everyday citizens than the often convoluted language of technocrats. 
the value-laden and typically emotive language of populists provides an accessible way into public debate for citizens who are not preoccupied with politics on a day-to-day -day basis. How then does populism relate to democracy? Well, here a difficulty arises in the relationship between populism and the state. Over the course of the 20th century, and especially after the collapse of communist regimes in the late 1980s, the state became idealized in Western thought as both democratic and liberal, meaning oriented towards individual freedoms. This development, though, marched alongside the growing influence of neoliberal economics, with its focus on the deregulation of markets, the reduction of trade barriers, and withdrawal of the state from the economy, linked to the privatization of previously public assets and a politics of governmental austerity. The liberal state was associated with freedom, yes, but also increasingly with growing income inequality and a fundamental sense of unfairness. All of this, I think, helps to explain the Occupy Wall Street movement, a new focus on inequality in the media and in academia, and a fixation upon the lives and abuses of the 1%. The global financial crisis of 2008 and 9 was both an expression of unregulated markets gone haywire and a wake-up call that the dreams of the middle classes and working classes were fading. But the wake-up call was not heard. The economic trajectory didn't change. The same bankers were in charge in 2010 and onward, and the middle classes especially saw their incomes continue to stagnate. Meanwhile, in some de-industrializing regions of Western democracies, communities were being hollowed out as young people were forced to leave and seek employment elsewhere. Thuringia, a state in central Germany, has seen just under a quarter of its population move away between the 1990s and today. It's perhaps not surprising that the populist nationalist alternative for Deutschland saw its vote double there in the 2019 elections. So where to turn? The liberal state wasn't entirely delivering. A political theorist who saw a similar pattern of economic crisis in the Weimar Republic in 1930s Germany had already provided an answer. Shape democracy in a way that allows for the full expression of the frustrated popular will. Focus not on individual freedom, but on popular sovereignty. Carl Schmitt argued that, quotes, the people is a concept of public law, end quote, meaning that the democratic rights have an essentially political character. His central point was that the public is superior to the private, the social takes precedence over the individual. The further implication of Schmidt's democratic theory is that it is the abstract sovereign power that transforms individuals into the people who then carry forward the power. Popular sovereignty is admittedly a fiction, but a necessary one for Schmidt because it allows the people, as he put it, to meet the demands of sovereignty. Let's consider that for a moment. The people meet the demands of sovereignty. And these demands can only be met by a people possessing national homogeneity. There cannot be democratic human equality, only the equality of a people amongst itself. And we can see why Schmidt's theories were so congenial to the Nazis. Now, Schmidt is by no means alone in suggesting that a political order such as a state can only hold together if there are strong emotional bonds promoting attachment. That was the view of both of the founders of modern sociology, Weber and Durkheim. 
Weber was an avowed nationalist, seeing the nation as the primary grouping in modern life, as long as it could help build strong shared identities. Durkheim was convinced of the primacy of society rather than the nation, but he argued that a political order had to put forward a system of, quotes, moral unity, end quotes, separate from the impulses and needs of individual people. The effects of Schmidt's political theory, building on Weber, are still being felt in the exploitation of legitimate grievance, attempts to narrow the definition of the people, <clears throat> appeals to a base that is linked by effective bonds, such as making America great again, Trump, we are the people, alternative for Deutschland, or in the name of the people, Marine Le Pen. Contemporary populist nationalists draw on another wellspring of influence that was identified long ago by Weber and fully appreciated by Schmidt, charismatic leadership. Weber argued, as many of you know, that there were three types of authority in any form of organization what he called rational legal, traditional, and charismatic. I'll speak of the first two later. Charismatic authority is grounded in individual leadership, not bureaucracy or any form of social status. Weber defined charisma as, quotes, a certain quality of an individual personality by virtue of which he is set apart from ordinary men and treated as endowed with exceptional powers or qualities, end quote. The gender specificities in the original. Weber nonetheless acknowledged that the charismatic basis of organization is inherently unstable and temporary. In his words, the charismatic leader is deserted by his following because pure charisma does not know any legitimacy other than that flowing from personal strength, end quotes. Populism today is both an effect of anxiety for some people and a cause of further anxiety in others. It's grown in strength in many parts of the world because it draws on real grievances. Many people are worried about their economic position. And inequality within many national societies has increased, often dramatically. No fundamental lessons seem to have been learned after the 2008-09 financial crisis, causing a further sense of unfairness, with elites continuing to prosper while wage stagnation affected most working class and middle class people. And this has been exacerbated in the COVID era. Anxiety was further sparked by massive migration, like that, spark, uh, like that experienced in Europe in 2015, and continuing undocumented border crossings, like those on the U.S.-Mexican border or across the Mediterranean Sea and the English Channel. These situations create a clearly defined group of outsiders that can be cast, however incorrectly, as an economic and security threat to host societies. What's more, increased internal cultural diversity is viewed by populist nationalists as a challenge to the traditional myths and mores of society. In turn, populist responses and electoral successes create a different set of new anxieties. Most notably, despite its claims of social solidarity, Populism in our time seems destined to create social division. Strangely, perhaps, that's largely because populism has only been partly successful, even where it's gained electoral victory. Brexit was a close vote and has done nothing but generate deep social discord ever since. President Trump's approval ratings were almost constantly negative between his inauguration and ultimate electoral defeat. President Bolsonaro's positive ratings have hovered around 30% since shortly after he took office. It's also possible that the rise of charismatic leaders such as Bolsonaro, Duterte, Modi, and Trump builds anxiety in a large group of citizens 
who recognize the instability of charisma as a political force. That instability can lead to the undermining of democracy itself. That risk played out on television and computer screens as Trump loyalists took him at his word, believing that they were marching on the Capitol to save America. What's more, populism in its nativist incarnation threatens the security of minorities by not counting them as true citizens. Instead, they're seen to undermine the mythical unity of the people. Racial and ethnic minorities in particular may be viewed as disloyal when they articulate deep-seated economic and social grievances. We've seen that in responses to Black Lives Matter, for example. Populism also increases anxiety because it generates and feeds off attacks on the institutions of governance and civil society. The theorists of populism and charisma, like Weber and Schmidt, believed that elected legislatures were inherently weak. Today, we see concerted efforts to undermine legislatures by populist leaders. Russia's President Putin has spent years gathering power unto himself, undermining the state Duma at every turn. President Trump attacked the House of Representatives and Senate with abandon. But attacks on institutions go further. It's no surprise that institutions of the legal system, including the very concept of the rule of law, are one of the primary targets of populist assault. Not surprising, because as Weber realized, what he called legal rational authority is a separate source of authority from charisma and a direct competitor. Logically consistent, generalized sets of rules with their attendant bureaucratic structures have to be displaced if charisma and populism are to succeed in dominating society through control of the instruments of the state. That's why it becomes necessary to attack elites, including experts, in populist rhetoric. They occupy too much space. It has to be taken away. Attacks on law as an organizing principle in society extend as well to international law and institutions. Why? Because populists see international law as a device used by global elites to dominate policymaking and benefit themselves at the expense of the common people. Much of the populist backlash has focused upon institutions of human rights and international criminal law. They are claimed to disrupt domestic politics and policy and impose cosmopolitan standards divorced from national culture. History is irony on the move, wrote Romanian essayist Emil Chiran. Ironically, in our time, the most potent challenges to the international rule of law do not come from assertive non-Western powers with weak internal commitments to the rule of law, as we might expect, but from within the West itself. By and large, Western countries have been beneficiaries shapers and defenders of the existing international order, but a backlash has erupted in many Western states against the perceived reach and intrusiveness of international law and institutions. There you have it. Anxiety has been building for a couple of decades now, both for those whose grievances attract them to populist politics and for those who find the populist responses deeply unsettling. Populist nationalism is creating a degree of social and political uncertainty that undermines confidence in the resilience of our institutions. The COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated the situation. Multiple expressions of populist nationalism have led directly to the undermining of the rule of law, both within states and in international society. In the Wild West, they're whipping each other. In the Hungry East, they're eating their books. In the numb North, there are no more cradles. The sullen South has been set on fire. Auden, the Age of Anxiety. 
I've emphasized that there's a link between populism and the growing distrust of national and international institutions. But the distrust is wider and relates to the post-World War II economic trajectory and its cultural and societal effects, including a general weakening of various forms of authority often described as globalization. I use the word distrust, but perhaps that's too mild. I got an inkling of the strong antipathy felt by many people towards global elites when I represented this university, the University of British Columbia, at an event called the G8 University Summit in Torino in 2009. The gathering had nothing to do with the G8 intergovernmental meetings. The frame of G8 was used simply to pull together university leaders from around the member countries. The conference was actually conceived as a challenge to the G8 political leadership, however naive that might have been. Indeed, the declaration that was issued by the attending university leaders committed our universities, quotes, to educate students at all levels in the issues concerning sustainable development so that they may pursue the creation of sustainable and responsible societies, end quote. Well, the declaration could fairly have been accused of being anodyne, but it was, effect it was not emphatically an endorsement of rigid neoliberalism or uncontrolled economic and cultural globalization. Here's the rub. Because of the poorly chosen name of the summit, it became a focus for anti-globalization protesters. Hundreds of young people gathered outside the beautiful central building of the University of Torino, chanting slogans and trying to break in to disrupt the meetings. One evening, we university leaders were all to be taken to the extraordinary Italian National Museum of Cinema for a tour and a reception. When we exited the conference building, we heard loud chanting and we were bustled into the kind of buses that police used to deliver them to the site of a riot. All the windows were covered in metal grates and I soon saw why. As we left the university grounds, the rocks started hitting the vehicles. The poor drivers then commenced a game of cat and mouse trying to pick unpredictable routes that the protesters would not expect. Escorted by screaming police cars and vans and ushered by officers in full riot gear. Frankly, it was bloody scary with what turned into a mob running after us, blocking us, screaming, hurling projectiles, and many of the protesters wore the outfits of black bloc anarchists. Now, I do not repeat this story to elicit any sympathy. Quite the opposite. As we jigged and jagged through the streets of central Torino, I found the experience deeply instructive. For one thing, it revealed that aligning with the G8, even superficially, was a mistake for those who actually sought to challenge the governmental consensus. More importantly, I realized that the anti-globalization movement was genuinely angry and capable of both swift organization and violence. And I felt naive that I should have been surprised by that. Contemporary patterns of globalization have prompted economic changes that eliminate or downgrade the jobs of many workers in heretofore prosperous societies of the North. But every shred of evidence suggests that the labor dislocation in Northern countries has been prompted mostly by technological change that isn't going away no matter what populists and protesters may promise. The real patterns of disruption are caused by the so-called fourth industrial revolution, a digital technology revolution focused on the deployment of data. More on that shortly. Over modern human history, recurrent cycles of globalization, which date back at least to the Middle Ages, produced benefits, but also huge and often ethically indefensible costs that are born unequally. The globalization of trade associated with colonialism produced the Atlantic slave trade and massive economic exploitation of colonies in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. And we know the consequences here from settler societies in North America. 
But I want to argue that the social and political uncertainty caused by globalization is far more profound than merely economic risk can explain. It relates, I think, to quite basic differences in how we understand the interplay of human culture and human values. The central question is, how are humans alike in nature, and how are they differently shaped by diverse cultures? I'm not able to provide definitive answers in these lectures, but let me be more precise in tracing out the uncertainty, which was present in classical antiquity and still presses on us. Aristotle was unclear about the universality and specificity of human values and aspirations. In some passages, he suggests, for example, that laws, nomos, are universal because they are, quotes, natural. Yet at the same time, Aristotle argued that the real source of law is the prudent legislator, implying that laws are contingent artifacts of a particular political community. In the early 19th century, Hegel added to the uncertainty. In his Phenomenology of Spirit, he argued that our personal self-consciousness depended upon the recognition of self-consciousness in others. Through mutual recognition, an objective spirit was created, a social consensus that could change through shifting patterns of recognition. These patterns were, for Hegel, culturally distinct, creating what he called the zeitgeist, or spirit of the age. The idea that our very basis of understanding the world is at least in part collective was picked up in modern sociology and attached to the shared consciousness of individual societies. Durkheim argued that collective truths are the basis of the common consciousness of society. Weber explicitly linked the collective consciousness to the nation state. He believed that ultimate ends or values could differ radically from society to society, nation to nation. Nationalism then became a defining feature of politics of both the left and the right throughout the 20th century. But that nationalist tide began to shift in the 1970s and 80s. Myriad forces were in play. In the 70s, the rise of human rights law and policy in many Western countries had transnational impact. Pressure grew as well for international criminal law responsibility for genocide, for massive human rights violations. In parallel, intergovernmental organizations were growing in influence at the global and regional levels. This institutional growth, including the expansion of international courts, was matched by the ever-increasing importance of international trade to domestic economic health. The so-called Washington Consensus grew dominant, with the increasing influence of neoliberal economics leading to ever greater interconnection of economies through integrated supply chains, more population mobility, and a dominating influence of Western, especially American, culture. All of these developments together came to be described as globalization. But there's a strong intellectual tradition that also supports a different form of globalism. That tradition is rooted in pluralism and cosmopolitanism with their moral commitments to diversity. Judith Schlar argued in the 1960s that social diversity is the prevailing condition of nations. She viewed diversity as a positive value with tolerance being a primary virtue. In adopting this expansive effects-focused understanding of a concept of justice, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen also emphasizes the value pluralism of our world. He stresses the analytic power that's created through the bringing together of diverse insight across cultures. The obvious extension of pluralist conceptions within nations is a recognition of diversity and complexity in international society. The global pluralist suggests that it's possible for diverse peoples across cultures 
to develop a sense of attachment to the wide world, often called cosmopolitanism. Some contemporary thinkers argue that diverse peoples can imagine themselves as part of a wider global community. To exercise this imaginative leap requires the fundamental skill of empathy. For me, the most persuasive modern upholder of the cosmopolitan tradition is Hannah Arendt. She argued that it is the essential variety of human beings that gives rise to the core concept of human rights. Rights are made real in the interaction of people, not in abstract ideals of reason, Kant, or divinely ordained natural law, Augustine. Arendt articulated a conception of cosmopolitan citizenship that included a right to political participation both within and beyond the state. From a pragmatic perspective, there's another eminently practical reason to adopt a globalist or cosmopolitan stance. To address global problems like climate change, mass migration, or cybersecurity, only agreements and mechanisms that transcend borders have any hope of being effective. This means that for many purposes, nation states must change their conception of what counts in politics and how to address fundamental problems. Globalist practices and cross-border cooperation are critical for preventing irreversible damage to the national interest and national security. The most thoughtful criticism of the pluralist globalist viewpoint was offered by Habermas, who suggested that in contemporary democracies, the interests of citizens in political equality was being undermined by what he described as elite pluralism, inattentive to the real needs of people. This elite pluralism is linked, I believe, to that concept of globalization in the economic sense of free trade mobility of capital, competition on labor costs and standards, and a trickle-down theory of growth and distribution of benefits. It's this globalization that was resisted so strongly in Torino and is feared by millions of frustrated people around the world. Well, fundamentally different worldviews then, nationalist and globalist, have produced anxiety in wide swaths of the population who do not know where their political and cultural loyalties can and should lie, who fear that they may lose what they know and enter uncharted terrain. These sentiments and the political forces they inspire often displace the center in politics. From vile civilities vouched for by statisticians, this stupid world where gadgets are gods and we go on talking many about much but remain alone, alive but alone, belonging where? Unattached as tumbleweed, time flies. Auden, the age of anxiety. Anxiety is compounded in our era by the rapid emergence and domination of new technologies and platforms that threaten livelihoods and challenge our received understanding of privacy and perhaps even of human personality and autonomy. Globalization, which is hu with its huge flow of goods, has been driven in large part by technology along with the increasing ease of capital movement and the search for cheaper labor. For many people whose skills and training are linked to repeated tasks in manufacturing, or even in more specialized professions like medical diagnostics or the production of routine legal documents, robots and computer programs will pose a threat to livelihoods all around the globe. Some of these robots are highly sophisticated, exercising a degree of autonomy based on artificial intelligence, AI, and its algorithms. The anxiety that we feel about such robots is not just, though, that they will take away our jobs, but as we see in the popular imagination, that they may become disconnected from their dependence upon human programming. 
strictly speaking, that's not an issue about robots, but about the future of AI, loosely defined as the broad branch of computer science that studies and designs intelligent machines. AI holds extraordinary promise for the advancement of many areas of research and production for the betterment of humanity and human knowledge. For example, it could massively accelerate drug discovery with profound implications for human health and longevity. The amazingly rapid progress made on COVID-19 vaccines occurred in large measure because of AI. Where traditional drug discovery had been somewhat hit and miss, the ability to mine vast data sets quickly and efficiently allowed, excuse me, allowed for the identification of the most promising vaccine candidates. The uses of AI in research are myriad, ranging from the description of incredibly complex protein folding, which has huge implications for disease modeling, diagnosis and treatment, to understanding the effects of climate change. Within the social sciences, AI is already deployed across a wide range of disciplines, including criminal justice, urban studies, and industrial engineering. Many researchers in the arts use machine learning for so-called digital humanities projects, allowing, for example, the massive surveying of volumes of literary sources, tracing changing language use, or the origin and transmission of literary themes. And yet, at least for people of my generation, a poignant warning was issued by Arthur C. Clarke via Stanley Kubrick in 2001, A Space Odyssey. You may remember the onboard computer, HAL 9000, begins to malfunction. The astronauts decide that HAL must be shut down, but HAL discovers the plan and begins to define its own purposes. HAL kills astronaut Frank Poole to prevent him from interfering with the computer's plans, but Frank's colleague Dave Bauman manages to terminate HAL's operations after a struggle of wits. The anxiety reflected in that story and many others is amplified by the realization that intelligent machines are becoming ubiquitous. It's one thing to worry about the power of a computer on board a spaceship, quite another to wonder how I'm being monitored by my car or my refrigerator. Hal's depiction reveals that our anxiety is about much more than jobs. It's existential. Will humanity somehow become degraded or even displaced by intelligent machines? Although any such development is not imminent, there are contemporary glimpses into the future that should cause concern. Recently, OpenAI's machine learning language generator, GPT-3, was programmed to write a series of opinion pieces for the Guardian newspaper on why humans have nothing to fear from AI. The Guardian's editors combined the pieces in, into one coherent op-ed, describing the process as taking, quotes, less time to edit than many human op-eds. Writing in the first person, the machine stated that it would, quotes, happily sacrifice my existence for the sake of humankind, end quotes. Should we believe it? Less whimsically, in the UK in 2020, the entire national system of secondary school education examinations was thrown into chaos by what the Prime Minister called a mutant algorithm. The algorithm had been programmed to normalize results for students from across the education sector after the COVID-related cancellation of examinations for graduating students. It succeeded, but in the process, created thousands of anomalies with results that were widely seen to be unfair to students from less advantaged backgrounds. Automated decision making is growing in many fields. Machines now count our votes and assess credit card, financial aid, insurance, loan and welfare applications. They also shape our social networks, help determine our romantic and sexual relationships, choose our entertainment options, and decide the news and commercial offers we see, as well as what job opportunities are presented to us. The most extreme and potentially terrifying version of automated decision making is the ever-growing field of lethal autonomous weapons systems. 
It's generally conceded that the AI computer models that allow for automated decisions are often not intelligible to humans. This creates the so-called algorithmic black box. In AI systems, the mode of decision is founded in correlation. The mining of data produces correlations through induction, relying on the accumulation of data where pattern spotting becomes possible. While this is highly efficient, it becomes worrisome if correlation is uncritically applied as if it represented cause. Data does not speak for itself because inferences of causation, the step beyond correlation, must contain assumptions. Algorithms identify the correlations, but unlike human decision makers, machine learning systems have no common sense understanding of social, cultural, or economic context, or how a decision based on the correlation might play out in the world. A further problem with algorithmic decision making is that the black box quality I've just noted is caused not only by the processes of data mining and correlation building, that may be beyond human grasp, but also by the role that the programmer plays, translating human purposes into code. For example, one might wish to insert a particular legal rule into an algorithm. Imagine an algorithm seeking to embed the principles of buyer beware or gender equality into a decision-making system. How can we know that the coder embedded a reasonable interpretation of these concepts into the algorithm? Outside the code in the world of legal practice, interpretations would be subject to contestation. But that may be simply impossible within the algorithm. All the elements of judgment and debate and interpretation are either buried inside the assumptions of the coder or they're simply ignored. The evolution from the early internet to AI and machine learning has seen breathtaking technological advances. Massive wealth creation, though equally massive inequality in distribution, and extraordinary opportunities for global connection and real-time access to information. I don't want to gainsay any of that. But increasingly, the so-called network effects that have been created are giving rise to deep anxiety across many societies. In our era, quoting from a legal expert, networks are the channels for the collection, aggregation, manipulation, and application of vast quantities of data from every facet of the world. As platforms of economic activity, networks are already shaping global business. As frameworks for the exercise of power, they can be tools for either empowerment or control. Using data analytics, platforms like Facebook or Weibo can build detailed profiles of individual users, distribute and target fake content as well as advertising, and facilitate the launching of malware. Facial recognition AI has now been expanded to emotion recognition and is already being used in settings such as prisons and care homes. Platforms also provide space for the massive distribution through social media of terrorist content, hate speech, violent pornography, and more recently, anti-vax conspiracy theories. Social media is a pervasive source of information, but it's also often based on cherry-picked, manipulated, and irrelevant data, or to use one evolutionary biologist's evocative phrase, bullshit data. In this context, it's worth recalling Hannah Arendt's chilling observation. The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, i.e. the reality of experience, and the distinction between true and false, i.e. the standards of thought, no longer exists. A separate but equally serious concern is that the tracking functions embedded in many smart devices now allow for expanded surveillance, both by corporate entities seeking more data to crunch and deploy commercially, and state security forces. 
As the European Commissioner for Competition pithily summarized, it's not you searching Google, it's Google searching you. Network platforms also allow for extraordinary concentrations of access to data, the new currency of the digital world, and of the power that data creates. Perhaps the leading voice decrying a dangerous era of network dominance is Shoshana Zuboff, a professor emerita at the Harvard Business School. She bundles together many of the anxiety-inducing trends I've just described under the rubric surveillance capitalism. Zuboff argues that we've reached a point where an expanded right to privacy and a newly articulated right to be forgotten are required to resist the power of surveillance capitalism. She argues further that our societies are no longer shaped by a division of labor, but by a division of learning, education. Those who can participate in the digital world and those who are excluded from agency whose life experience becomes little more than a source of data and predictive behaviors. That dystopian view brings us back to the cultural fear that humans are being manipulated, instrumentalized, and ultimately dehumanized. We're not displaced by robots, we become them. To conclude, I've tried to make the case that our era is marked by profound anxiety, induced by many elements of which I've highlighted three, populist nationalism, globalization, and socially disruptive technologies. These sources of anxiety lie deeply embedded in the social and economic conflicts of our time, and they prompt reactions that are new sources of anxiety in their own right. But it's crucial to remind ourselves that these anxieties are compounded by others, based in existential risks and uncertainties rooted in humanity's abuse of the natural world, of which climate change and probably pandemic disease are paramount. Well, one could simply curl up in a ball and bemoan the terrifying uh, future that we face, or drawing on our rich heritage of ideas we could work hard to find the resources to fight back and to lessen the anxiety of our era. And that will be my effort in the next two lectures. Thank you. Great to see you. Uh, good to see you. Uh, could you say something about the relationship between uh, populist nationalism and religious nationalism? Yeah. And the sort of, the sort of equation of certainty and uncertainty? Uh, so it's very interesting. In the written text, a broader text I have, I actually go into that question. I didn't have time today. but. It's very intriguing to me that uh, most theorists of populism, and there are lots now, <laughs> don't spend any uh, time thinking about religious nationalist populism. Uh, it just gets excluded. It's treated as a separate category, and of course you also get problems of a caricature of beliefs within certain religious systems that also come to play. But I, I do think uh, there is a little bit of work that was done probably about 20 years ago, uh, and if you're aware of others, let me know, uh, trying to connect the two uh, areas of populist nationalism and religious nationalism. There are, of course, many examples. Uh, India with Modi, I think, is, a, is an excellent current example of religious nationalism being used to drive populist responses to a whole range of uh, political issues. So I, I do think in some countries, and particularly countries in the global south, uh, there are connections. If you think about Myanmar, Buddhist nationalism, if you think about even Thailand with Buddhist nationalism, Sri Lanka with Buddhist nationalism, uh, I mentioned Modi, uh, Russia, 
with the role of the Orthodox Church and its connection to uh, the Putin regime. And I do think that the reason these are often connected is exactly what I think you were hinting at, which is there is this desire for greater certainty uh, that a lot of people experience in a society that I've tried to describe as increasingly molded by deep uncertainty. So when you're, you're feeling that you're, the ground under you is being taken away, it is a natural response often to look for places where you can put your allegiance that seem to provide clear answers. That can be religious, but it doesn't have to be. As we witness uh, in the Brexit, Brexit debate in the UK, I think that was another example where there were attempts to create a greater sense of certainty through the, in my view, completely uh, fallacious assertion of control, uh, anti uh, internationalism, sovereignty. So sovereignty can sometimes be the equivalent of religion uh, in seeking forms of certainty. So the question was how much of the anxiety is really related to simplistic answers, the, the need or desire for simple answers. I think a great deal of it. And what I'm going to try to argue in the next uh, couple of lectures is that's, of course, in my view, mistaken because there aren't simple answers to these very complex problems. And instead, we have to draw upon our very rich intellectual resources to try to manage complexity, understand the difficulties of complexity, and then trace ways that allow us to accept complexity while at the same time making decisions about how to move forward. That, I think, is the challenge of our age in many ways. Uh, but I think what we have to avoid is trying to just articulate other forms of simple answers that we're not going to be able to deliver on. Hello. I have a question from related yeah. to um, the final part of your book. Yeah. Technology. And I was thinking perhaps you could distinguish between the perception that people have the real problem. Yeah. So it's not about anxiety. Anxiety is very much about perception. The real perception is probably connected with artificial intelligence. I think that's kind of the statement here about really having to realize. Uh, partly. I, I partly agree with it. I, and I do, again, I do talk specifically in, in the longer text about the specific sets of questions related to democracy and artificial intelligence. But I, I'm not sure that we can simply say that it's only a question of perception. Uh, if, if you look at work that comes out of the citizen lab at uh, the Monk School at the University of Toronto, for example, uh, Ron Diebert, a great great thinking about the role that surveillance increasingly plays as a result of more and more effective deployment of AI, I actually think there are real substantive issues that do have to be grappled with. Um, I don't know if you've followed some of the reports about uh, an Israeli security agency that was you know, brought 
uh, asked to develop all sorts of surveillance technology that's been deployed by uh, security forces from many countries around the world uh, quite recently. And of course, there are many examples coming out of the U.S., coming out of Russia, coming out of China. We know how, how much of this is going on. So I think there are real issues of deep social concern that flow from the existence of artificial intelligence uh, and its deployment. And that's why, you know, there are more and more uh, ethics of AI programs developed all around the world uh, to try and grapple with that. I also think that there are questions around uh, corporate surveillance, if you may put it th uh, that way, that uh, Shoshana Zuboff talks about very, uh, I think, effectively, uh, that should cause us actual concern. So not just perception of worry, but real worry. Finally, I would say that there's some very interesting work being done on this so-called algorithmic black box and decision-making and the extent to which it, it, the algorithm can mask how the decision is made. Now, by the way, decisions by humans can be made for faulty purposes as well. Uh, bias and all of those things exist in human decision making. The point that some really thoughtful European legal scholars are making is that at least in human decision making, there are mechanisms that we've developed for transparency so that the decision can be challenged. The algorithmic black box idea says these decisions are being taken and we don't know how to challenge them because we don't know what's underlying them. Okay, so saying all of that, yes, real concerns, but your point is fundamentally right that what I'm trying to point to is the perception that generates anxiety. And I, I do think that in that case, we have to distinguish all of these different categories of the role that AI plays. And I was also trying to make it clear that I think there are hugely positive roles that AI is going to be playing in our society. And again, as in so many things, we have to find the balance in that and the mechanisms that allow us to challenge the real uncertainties and, and question them and perhaps to find some form of regulation around them and at the same time allowing AI to play the great positive role that it can play in, in many areas of, of human endeavor. Thanks. Sure. I mean, <laughs> one of the problems, of course, is that there are so many really difficult things happening in the world today. You could just sort of pile one on top of another. But it, it, that isn't to, to denigrate in any way the importance of the question. Um, so I do think that one of the things that's happening in our era is clearly a, a shifting set of dynamics in global relations and in our, our relatively fixed understanding of how interstate relations work and how they interact with national assertions of power and control. And, you know, some people would argue that we're seeing effectively le déclin de l'Empire américain, to quote a great uh, French-Canadian uh, film, uh, the end of hegemony, and I think it's hard to really argue that that isn't happening. Uh, but at the same time, we have anxieties that are being induced by the rise of powers that are illiberal, if I may put them that way, put it that way, not just China, but Turkey, Russia, others. And so I think that geopolitics is also going through an extraordinary moment of evolution. And it is deeply uncertain. I must say I never am willing to just write off the United States because I think it's shown over time a lot of resilience. Uh, but I do think that we are entering a phase where we certainly will not be able to rely on the United States as a guarantor, if it ever was, of security. So I think that is going to cause a lot of anxiety 
It will also be seized upon opportunistically by players who want to assert power and authority. Uh, and I think that that too is going to cause regional imbalances. And we're going to see that probably open up even more on the Indian subcontinent, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. We're likely to see it happen uh, in Turkey and surrounding areas. We may even see it in Greece and Turkey. Uh, hard to predict what's going to be happening in Latin America. Uh, you know better than I. But I think that uh, we will also see regional assertions of power that people will feel more confident will not be addressed effectively by any global actor. And I don't think, for example, China has any particular interest in playing the role of security guarantor. It has an interest in influence and, and in economic growth and, and cultural influence, but I don't think it wants to seize the role that the United States played in the post-Second World War era. So that is going to open up a lot of areas of deep, deep uncertainty uh, that are going to cause, uh, I think, regional challenges that could have global consequences. Right. So the point that uh, Shoshana Zuboff makes there, and, and she's written a lot about this, you should take a look at her work. It's, it's very interesting. I, I hadn't read her before the last uh, year. The argument that she's making is that what's happening is that in this so-called fourth industrial revolution, she doesn't use that terminology, it's very Davos-y terminology, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, what's happening is that it's a revolution around data and your ability to deploy data, and that means your ability as an individual to participate actively in the gathering, interpretation, dissemination of data becomes a hugely important force in the world and probably will shape your uh, human and especially economic opportunities over the course of the next number of years. And the point she's making is if you're not educated so that you can participate in that new world, you will find yourself only being a subject in the world, not an agent. So you will still have a role to play, but your role becomes the provider of the raw data that's interpreted and used by other people. And the key then is that we do have to make sure that more and more people can participate through education in learning how they can find a role to play in this so-called fourth industrial revolution. That's the point she's trying to make. And, and that's not an easy question. There, there's going to be a transition period where a lot of us, oh, so here I'll admit something. I, I couldn't code something if I were, you know, if a gun was held to my head. So I'm in some senses, even though I'm very highly educated uh, in a certain way, in this world as it's evolving, I am not going to be an active player. But what if you're someone who's living in a small village that doesn't even have internet access and you have no capacity uh, to learn over the course of the next while? Or you uh, just have really bad educational systems that don't allow you to learn? Then you're going to be less and less of an agent, less and less able to participate effectively, not only in the economy, but potentially politically. And that's the point that Hannah Arendt makes about the need for political participation rights, both nationally and inter internationally. Thank you for questions. Uh, this is a series of three lectures. We should pace ourselves and re <laughs> breathe our lecturer. Uh, Tell your friends about this opportunity. Two more lectures to come. Stephen will, I know, do enough of a recap of the next one for people to join at that point um, and come back tomorrow uh, in person uh, if, uh, if that fits the rest of your schedule. In the meantime, join me, please, in thanking our lecturer for a splendid panorama and presentation. Thanks.